Hello and good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, as the case may be, and welcome to today's presentation of what's new in the SQL Server tools at Data Platform Summit 2020. Let's start with a quick round of introductions. Hi, I'm Vicki Harp. I'm the Group PM Manager for the SQL Server Tools and Experiences team at Microsoft. I've been at Microsoft for about two and a half years now, and I've been working with SQL Server for about 20 years now. So uh, in my role, I uh, lead up the PM team that looks after uh, all of the tools and experiences for SQL Server. And uh, as we discussed today, a little bit beyond that in Azure Data Studio across a, a wider variety of data platforms. Thanks, Vicki. And I'm Ken Van Heining, the Group Engineering Manager for SQL Client Tools and Drivers. All right, and since we are uh, recording this ahead of time, that means that you can actually answer your questions into the chat throughout, and uh, we'll be able to answer them as we go. So please feel free to answer questions as we go, and we'll just proceed from here. So let's get started. The main framing thing that I wanted to start with today to kind of give you a sense of what we're talking about when we're talking about SQL Server experiences is this diagram that we came up with a while back to show the layers of experience out from the most base uh, level at the SQL Server engine all the way up to the graphical interfaces. And I'd say a lot of people expect when we're talking about SQL experiences, they're thinking about these graphical interfaces. They're thinking about SSMS, Azure Data Studio, and the Azure Portal. But it's really important to remember that those experiences are built upon the stacks of other deeper experiences, starting at the level of the drivers and libraries that are used at a programming level, building out to CLI and scripting interfaces. And then we've got this notion of notebooks in between as a graphical uh, version of a, it's a, a scripting with some uh, UI affordances to make it a little bit easier to use. And then finally, the graphical interfaces use a lot of that underlying technology in order to bring things out to you in the form of wizards and rich interfaces like query editors. So when we're talking about experiences, we're talking about this entire stack of them. And a lot of times the rate at which things show up in these experiences differs. Uh, so you have things that are showing up in the graphical interfaces during the monthly and quarterly releases for say Azure Data Studio and SSMS on a more continuous basis uh, as well on in the Azure portal. But then something like uh, new CLI and scripting interfaces happen a little bit less frequently. And then the drivers and libraries tend to move more at the speed of the engine itself in terms of the uh, the features actually light up at the same time that the features are announced in the SQL Server engine. So those don't happen quite as often. So Ken, do you have anything to kind of add to this, this framing? Yeah, thanks Vicki. I think one of the things I loved about getting the structure of this, uh, this taxonomy for us to talk about tools has really helped a lot with the uh, work that we have to do across our internal partners and the other feature teams down in the SQL Server engine. A lot of times, as Vicky was mentioning, there's there people think just at the very highest level, but what we're, where we really need work and partnership is around the, the drivers, the APIs that those tools are going to uh, require, and it enables us to have a much more structured conversation, and it also allows us to do work in parallel much, e uh, much earlier with those feature teams than waiting till we have the final rich user experience defined, tested, and, and delivered. That uh, gives us the ability to do things like work at the SMO level or DACFX level. And then we've started shipping those, as we'll talk about in a little bit, as first-class citizens, as their own deliveries and their own uh, packages that we ship, which enables other people to build applications using those same APIs that we're using. And then I'd, I'd add probably one of my favorite things just over the last year or so is this idea of being able to talk to teams about notebooks as an experience to help them develop their features. Whereas it can take a lot of work and a lot of time just to get a great graphical experience that then hides underneath the work that really needs to happen at the API level to provide that great experience. But with notebooks, people are able to iterate very quickly on the exact APIs. As Vicky was saying, it, it allows a, a richer, more intuitive scripting experience, and that exercises those APIs that teams need to build. So when we're working with the SQL Server Engine team, and if they don't have the DMV we quite need, or they don't have quite the, the right syntax, or that's confusing, that'll show up in the notebooks a lot sooner than waiting to the very end when we have a graphical interface done. So it's really been a great addition to the way that we work with teams internally. And then I really love the way that it just structures the portfolio and talks about the different layers of, of the work that we deliver and the ways that each of those can be optimized for users. 
yeah, so what we're going to do today is we're going to walk through and talk about some of the things that are happening in each of these different levels uh, of the experience from the drivers out to the graphical interfaces. And we'll sprinkle in a couple um, demos as we go. And as I said, you know, please ask questions as we go. We're here to talk to you and to, to share information. So to start out our conversation, let's talk a little bit about the drivers and libraries. So when we're talking about drivers and libraries, we're talking about the pretty large set of drivers that we have that are actually the language drivers that allow different lang programming languages to communicate with SQL Server over TDS, uh, which is the pro data protocol that is used to connect to SQL Server. So SQL Client is probably one of the most critical and well-known ones being the uh, driver for .NET. Uh, but we also support JDBC for uh, Java, ODBC, which is across a large number of languages, including C and C++, OLADB, which is uh, a bit of an older uh, driver that's still used by a lot of applications, PyODBC, which is for Python, PHP for PHP. Uh, there is a driver called TDS, which is uh, uh, for Node.js, and then we have Go, and we've actually increasingly been investing as well in Django. So across all of these different drivers, you can think about there's kind of an orthogonality matrix on what features uh, of SQL Server are exposed in which drivers, when they arrive, what are the different language specific features of those drivers. So those all release on uh, something from either an annual up to, you know, sometimes a quarterly or more often basis with new features and bug fixes, etc. And then the layer above that, we have SMO, which is SQL Management Objects, and DACFX. And these are two application libraries that are used to interface with SQL Server uh, for kind of management purposes uh, in the case of SMO, and then for uh, more data migration uh, and database project purposes in the case of DACFX. And so these are um, really rich uh, uh, layers on which a lot of the graphical interfaces and other components of the SQL toolset are themselves built as well as being used by external parties for their, uh, you know, uh, applications and for, for their own purposes. Uh, so if we think about uh, how, how those kind of sit, fit together, um, these are some of those some, somewhat more slowly moving, uh, but really critical uh, application levels that, uh, you know, people don't maybe think about as often. Yeah, I think it's good to call out the work we did around the new uh, SQL client driver. So we, we did uh, really just because of the evolution of .NET Core and the direction that the developer division has been taking that to keep up with so many changes in the data platform. We now have a new driver for more modern applications or for people looking for the, the latest support in authentication, as well as we're even doing a lot of work on performance there. And that's the Microsoft.data.sql client version of that driver. And so that's now something that uh, is out in open source and we're continuing to invest in that and bring together some of the old technology that was in the original driver, as well as the support that we had for .NET Core. Uh, and then in regards to SMO and DECFX, as Vicky was saying, these are the two critical API families that we uh, provide from the tools team. And uh, SMO, most folks have probably heard of SMO. I know that some people even used to uh, take the SMO libraries out of either the SSMS or the SQL install because it gave a rich .NET API that you could use to manage SQL Server. And that's the asset that we saw it as as well. And what we've done in recent times is take that and make it its own first class NuGet package. And we're shipping that roughly on a quarterly basis uh, sometimes more, sometimes less, as Vicky said. It, it really, some of those things ebb and flow just depending on what's going on with the uh, work with the platform teams. Uh, similar DACFX is our ability to have that uh, representation of a, a database and be able to do things like schema compare, deploy, do the whole upgrade uh, workflows for deployment, CI, CD scenarios. And so that's kind of, we typically internally call that our developer APIs. Um, but both of those now are their first class citizens and we're investing heavily in both of those still today. And, and this is kind of the foundational piece as we were mentioning in the beginning that it enables us to have discussions earlier with those feature teams building out either T-SQL syntax or DMVs, or uh, sometimes it's even as simple as how are we going to know a given SKU or a given version of the engine is the right thing. And we want to be able to provide that within the API so that all the customers can build on top of that as well. And so these, by having these as a first class citizen, it really helps us have those conversations earlier with a really customer focused angle on it. 
Yeah, so if you want to find out a little bit more about that Microsoft Data SQL Client, uh, I would say take a look online. We have a couple blog posts and a couple of videos as well. Uh, this is a really important thing to be aware of if you are a .NET developer or if you're working with .NET developers, uh, to know that the new features and new uh, advancements that we're making at that level of the experiences are going to be landing in this Microsoft Data SQL Client driver uh, versus in the older System.Data SQL Client, which will continue to be maintained, but will not be having new feature work. And so that's one of the places that you can really see uh, kind of a, a, the beginning of a divergence, and you can see how things are landing in one versus the other. Uh, and so take a look at that if, if that's an area that you work in. And uh, if you are uh, a consumer of SMO or DACFX, you know, just uh, let us know if you can uh, use any help with those uh, uh, NuGet packages. So moving up to the CLI and scripting level, uh, we have a whole set of CLI command line interface applications that have shipped with SQL Server for, in some cases, many, many years. And then we have some relatively new ones as well. So SQL CMD and BCP are almost really just thin layers on top of the drivers. And so it allows you to pass through command line interfaces over TDS to the SQL Server. But then we have PowerShell, which is kind of a wrapper around SMO in some respects. It's, you know, it's, it's, it's more complex than that, but it's basically it allows you to do a lot of application management uh, through the uh, SQL Server PowerShell module. We have SQL Package, which is kind of does something similar for DACFX. And MS SQL CLI is one of our newer experiences, which is a more interactive version of the command line interface. This came out, uh, I guess, roughly earlier this year, uh, uh, late last year. And uh, this allows you to have more like wide result sets, horizontal scrolling, etc. It's a much uh, richer experience for people who are doing uh, querying interactively at the command line versus what you have with SQL CMD, where there's really not a lot of formatting. It kind of just blurts information out, uh, really intended more for an automation scenario. Uh, we haven't seen as much pickup on the MS SQL CLI. So honestly, over here in the questions, it would be really interesting to hear if any of you have been using it, uh, if you have uh, given it a try, if you've ever even heard of it. Uh, we think that this is a really um, uh, valuable and interesting uh, iteration on uh, the CLI experience for people, uh, and we're really interested in knowing how much more you'd like to see us uh, working in that area. Um, so uh, with the uh, CLI and scripting, uh, we also have this problem of there's kind of a proliferation of the tools. So we have MS SQL CLI, SQL CMD, BCP, as I've mentioned, and then there are others. Uh, uh, and so we're looking at putting them together to download together in something called the SQL Tools Package. So you'll be seeing that coming out from us probably in the next couple months here, where you can get all of the command line uh, tools kind of together in one download. This is closer to what you had uh, back in like SQL 2 2014 and earlier, whenever you did a install from the ISO or from the CD for SQL Server, you got all of the tools you know, located in one location. And then for a while, all of those tools were co-installed with SSMS, uh, but there hasn't been a, an easy way to just say, I want to get all the command line tools together. Uh, we also have some things working on like a SQL Server tools uh, uh, container uh, for those who are using Docker. And then over on the scripting side, uh, PowerShell continues to be really, really popular. We have uh, right now 11.9 million installations from the PowerShell gallery for the SQL Server module. So this is something that's really kind of a labor of love for the, uh, for the uh, part of the team that works on it to try to get that information out. And there's a really active community around this. And uh, we're always really happy to hear, you know, what do you need? Um, how are you using it? And help us to uh, grow it. Ken, do you have anything on this? Uh, no, just to uh, echo some of the same things. We'd love to see the uh, the activity of the PowerShell module. Uh, it's really one of those amazing things where the uptake for that and the, what the, the scenarios that uh, empowers is really exciting. Uh, we we do uh, have uh, I think roughly once every couple months we'll do a, we'll do some sort of release there and so it's it's something as uh, Vicky said it's a labor of love and I think we love the community so much around that that uh, there's a few folks on the team that just love to pour a little work into that uh, almost as their hobby now um, so we were very excited to see that continue to grow and then yeah very much uh, looking forward to getting some of these tool package and Docker containers to help folks manage the proliferation of tools and just make it a little easier to acquire and manage them. Yeah, so moving up 
one level from that, we have notebooks. And so when I'm talking about notebooks, I'm talking about notebooks as a, in, in this uh, diagram, I'm talking about notebooks as a technology set and not just notebooks as the graphical interface that we have for notebooks, which is something else that we can talk about as well. So notebooks are this concept that comes out of uh, the Python uh, community uh, for a Jupyter notebook. Uh, and it's kind of a combination, it's a, a file format that allows you to combine human readable text and executable code along with the result sets. And that itself becomes something that is portable. It's something that there are multiple viewers for, there are multiple uh, automation systems for, there are operationalization systems for, there's a really rich uh, ecosystem of this. And so we added this uh, support for this into our Azure Data Studio uh, tool uh, approximately two years ago. And since then, we've really seen a huge amount of interest and a huge number of uh, uh, scenarios that have come out of that as far as ways that people might use notebooks. So uh, the the one that I guess the listed here that it came as most traditional is this notebooks for data workflows, which is, you know, kind of the traditional Python way of using it where you're using notebooks to do experimentation, data science, maybe some data prep work. But right off the bat, we started seeing that people were wanting to use notebooks as documentation, especially in kind of the DBA world, using it as a run book, using it as a set of instructions or, or a set of steps to say, here's my text, here's my SQL code uh, that does what the text describes, and then here's the result set from that, seems to have landed really naturally with people. And that's part of why we moved very rapidly to try to get a SQL kernel to let you use native uh, T-SQL uh, in notebooks uh, to, to ha open up those uh, scenarios. We also started using notebooks as UX or as user interfaces so that we are now in Azure Data Studio using notebooks to do deployment and to do uh, kind of more advanced troubleshooting scenarios where you can have, um, you know, run this uh, notebook and then whenever you run into this issue, then run this other notebook and let it kind of guide you in a step-by-step -step manner through um, something that might otherwise have required some kind of custom tailored UX uh, or UI uh, development. And this can instead be delivered in the form of notebooks. And then we're working on uh, notebooks for collaboration for helping people to say from one person uh, working on a problem to transfer it over to another person, either from an on-call situation or if they're um, working with, you know, maybe a, a junior engineer who works as far as they can get and then uh, escalates the issue to a senior engineer and then operational notebooks where we can have uh, notebooks that, that run in response to activities. So you can either you know, have them as scheduled or you can say, when this happens, run this notebook, and then I want to be able to read the results. Uh, we're also looking at them for testing. So you can say, once you have all of these notebooks that you're using for documentation or you're using them for run books, uh, can you make it a test to say, will my run book still work after this next deployment? Uh, so this is an area that we're actually investing in a whole lot uh, internally, uh, we were using these uh, for our own uh, live site troubleshooting whenever we're working in Azure SQL. And we're uh, working a lot toward getting uh, rich documentation like the SQL 2019 big data clusters uh, now ships with a Jupyter book in Azure Data Studio, which is a whole collection of, uh, you know, really rich um, uh, documentation and, and troubleshooting for, for Jupyter. Uh, within the Jupyter book for the uh, big data cluster. So I'll do a quick demo on that. So right now I'm going to give you a bit of a demo of what a notebook is really used for. And I'm going to use the Azure Data Studio uh, viewer for it uh, to kind of give you a sense of what a notebook does and how it's different from a query. And then I'll show you a little bit about some of the special things we've done in Azure Data Studios to make uh, notebooks even easier to use for our users. So if you think about the traditional way that you've used uh, query editors with SQL Server, uh, it would be to do kind of a new query. And it's a very disconnected experience between your code and your result set. So let's just say I put a little comment here, list of databases as of November 2020, and then select star from list of databases. So I can save this file and I'll go ahead and save it as it's the databases. And then I'll run it and get my results. And then I can save it again 
uh, control S. But then if I hit save as CSV, save as Excel, I, I can get all of these ways to extract my data. But if I close this file and then go and reopen it, let's uh, get my list of databases, it doesn't have those results anymore. And that's just kind of the way it's always worked uh, within our um, uh, query editors. You know, you get the SQL file, but you don't get the results. So let's kind of compare how that would work with a notebook. So let's do a new notebook. And since we have the ability to do so, let's be a little bit fancier with the comment. So list of databases as of November 2020. And we'll make this part into a heading. And then we'll make this part bold italics. And then let's do a code cell. Select star from sys.databases. And then run that. And you can see we have the same results and we have the same ability to export to CSV, Excel, etc. But if I control S, save this and do uh, list of databases, then whenever I close and reopen it, I'm actually going to be able to still see the results. So I'll just to prove that out, I'll close that. I'll go back over here, pull up my list of databases, and it's going to load up the kernel and everything. But now we have that same result set. So this is, allows you to take your, your human readable markdown, your executable code, and the results of it, and share it from person to person, which is something that you had to do in separate artifacts before. So that's one of the fundamental differences between uh, the, the traditional query editor and the notebook. Now, this IPYMB file format that it's storing in, we have a viewer here in Azure Data Studio, but it's actually a fairly generic format. So if I were to go to here and say reveal in file explorer, uh, let's go take a look at that file format. So let's say open with notepad. And you can see it's really just a JSON file. And so we can here, see here that the kernel is SQL. Uh, this first cell is markdown. Here's the source code of it in uh, markdown. And then down here, we have the code that has the select star from sys.databases. So this format, this IPYMB file format, can be read and interpreted by multiple uh, Jupyter notebook editors, uh, you know, Visual Studio Code, uh, just various open source editors, et cetera. And now, while not all of them necessarily have access to the same kernels and the same uh, connectivity logic that can can change from from one to the other. This basic format is something that we're con keeping consistent, and this is what gives us that ability to do some of the open source work and the consistency work in terms of operationalization and pipelining that we were you know we've been talking about as being part of our notebook work here. And so let me show you a little bit more of what we've been doing with notebooks. So I showed you this uh, list of databases, and we had this uh, markdown experience. And as I was working on it, I was using what we call the rich text editor. So if I double click on this, you can see I have the ability to do all of these things, you know, just right here uh, with a quick, you know, highlighter, etc. If I wanted to, I could go over here and say I wanted to work on it in um, markdown, or I could go read the the, the raw markdown. Now, with our DBA users in particular and our database developers, we found that a lot of them weren't as familiar with writing and markdown in HTML. So we've been trying to default over to this rich text view. And we've also been adding a couple new and kind of fun features on that. So let me do a, a new notebook and show you some of that. So let's say I wanted to make a notebook from an existing web page. So let me go over here to, uh, I, this is a little preview of what's to come, uh, to my quick start for Azure Data Studio. So I'll go through and say, I want to copy some of this. So I'll get my connect to SQL server section here, and then just control C copy, go over here to my notebook, add a text, and then direct paste that in. So now we've got, that has been pasted directly in from uh, a uh, web page with all of the images, et cetera, right in place. So let's say I was working, you know, instead from PowerPoint or from another Word thing. So again, let's do uh, the presentation that we're working on right now. So I'll take, uh, copy this slide, and then let's go back to Azure Data Studio, new text, control V, paste it, and now we've got that slide. And it's telling me here that, you know, it's a very long uh, uh, file because if I go over into the direct markdown, you can see it's actually got quite a lot here uh, that it's 
converted it into. But when you look at it this way, you can just see, hey, it's a PowerPoint slide, or really an image version of that PowerPoint slide available for you. And then let's say that we wanted to do something more like a snipping tool. So I can go into snipping tool and let's say I want to take a look at this. Where'd my snipping tool go? Snipping tool. There it goes. And let's take this and I want to copy this. Control C directly from that. So again, I'll do another text cell, paste that in. We've got that. And then finally, what you might have seen, I was kind of previewing a little bit before. Let's do another text cell. Uh, it's fine for us to also do an animated GIF. So let me go over to my uh, list of dogs here. I just adopted an Australian Shepherd uh, this last week, which has been really fun for my family. So let, let's find a cutie in here. Uh, maybe. Uh, Let's take this little puppy here and we'll just copy that. Copy image. And we'll go back over here and paste that in directly. So now we have our little animated GIF. So this gives you the ability to really work in a very rich way within your notebooks. Now, how much you might particularly need to put an animated GIF in, you know, kind of remains to be seen, but we've certainly had a lot of cases where people are copying things over from OneNote, they're copying things over from PowerPoint, and they're copying things over from other rich documents as they're trying to create their documentation experiences. And to that end, we're also adding documentation experiences into Azure Data Studio directly. So let me close up some of these files and get a little cleaned up here and give you a look at what that might look like. So over here in the Jupyter uh, book area, we've got um, the ability to view the notebooks that I have open in my space. So this database list that I just added is available. Only it's not. Okay, I don't know about that. So let me click over here and then I'm going to pull up one of the built in books. So I hit control shift P to pull up the command palette and let's open the SQL Server 2019 guide. So this is a set of documentation. Uh, for the SQL Server 2019 big data clusters that's being delivered in the form of notebooks. So I can actually click through and say, I want to go to a diagnostic section. I want to go and take a look at the CPU and memory usage for all containers. And then it's got all of the code uh, that I need to run to uh, troubleshoot embedded here in an executable notebook. And we're doing a lot of work for this for external purposes. And we're also doing a lot of work for this for internal purposes for our internal live site users. Um, and so this is a really exciting area for us that we're really hoping to, to continue to work on. Another thing that we're working on is using uh, notebooks as a form of user interface. So let me go over here to our new deployment section and give you an example of that. So here we've got all these different forms of deployment that we can do for SQL Server, for Postgres, for Azure SQL Edge, etc. So I'm going to pick the SQL Server container image, select that, and then it's going to ask me a couple pre uh, uh, prereqs. So I'm going to choose SQL 2019 and then it wants to know the name. So I'm going to say test container one. Uh, let's do and let's put it on a different port. Open that notebook. And so you can see now we have a wizard uh, sort of experience that leads directly into a um, notebook experience which allows you to choose to run this now or to save it or to send it to someone else for them to run it on their own. And this has all of the code necessary uh, to download and start and run a uh, SQL Server uh, Docker container. So uh, as we were talking, um, I, you know, I talked a little bit about how we're using um, notebooks for our own internal live site. And so when I'm talking about that, we're saying that the, the actual engineers who are working on Azure services with Microsoft are beginning to use uh, notebooks in order to uh, drive their you know, on-call and their troubleshooting and whatever issues are uh, coming up. Uh, we have, at this point, over 12,000 different notebooks that they can use uh, to identify issues, and we're working across you know, 25 different services. So this is uh, really an interesting and fast-growing area where we're we're using our own tooling, both from the uh, you know end-to-end -end automation standpoint, and also from the graphical uh, standpoint, in that we're using Azure Data Studio for that. Uh, do you have anything to talk about with that, Ken? 
Yes, I, this is one of those areas that's just been super exciting and, and really came out of a, a funny little story. For those that did, haven't heard it, it was we were just doing a product review, as we do with Rohan on a regular basis. And we were showing some of the work on Azure Data Studio, and we had actually used the, the slide about talking about notebooks, which is truly one of my favorite slides ever because I'm sure everybody's had that experience of working with different teams that are all using the same word but mean different things. And that slide completely changed our ability to have effective conversations. So that was fabulous. And we were showing Rohan this stuff uh, and a lot of the new features and the progress. And he said, boy, I, I sure wish my life site engineers could have the same great experience that our customers are getting. And that really became the catalyst for us asking a bunch of questions of, yeah, why why aren't they? And why don't we have them use Azure Data Studio and Notebooks? And and it really kicked off uh, an internal work stream that's really just grown amazingly fast. And as Vicky is showing here, we have thousands of notebooks now converted. We built an entire automated pipeline to convert OneNote and transform its content into Markdown, maintain links, bunch of cool features there. I think you'll see, see some of those uh, exciting features uh, coming up as well. It, it, there's just some uh, a great uh, acceleration that's done by us having our own internal customers. We're able to quickly turn releases into our insiders release and get new features out. And it's pushed the notebook functionality forward much faster than we had uh, done before. And it's giving our live site engineers a much richer, better managed experience around all their content. And that content is super important for us to get it to be matured, be able to uh, keep it uh, accurate, allow people to give feedback on it. All these things that OneNote wasn't providing through notebooks, we're able to do that. And then as uh, we saw with operational notebooks, we'll be able to turn them into executable things that then eventually can be plugged into automation. So we're very excited about this work stream and the impact it's been having on our notebook investments. So now we get to kind of the, I guess, the crown jewel uh, on top of all of this, which is the set of graphical interfaces that we have uh, for, for SQL Server and really for Azure Data all up. So um, when we're talking about the graphical interfaces kind of specifically for SQL Server, we have kind of these three broad categories. We have uh, the SQL client tools, which is SSMS and Azure Data Studio, with SSMS having more of a strict, you know, SQL Server, uh, and the SQL family, uh, can, you know, affinity and Azure Data Studio having more of an affinity toward SQL Server and the rest of the Azure Data platform. You know, increasing uh, service offerings as as we go. Um, then Azure SQL Portal, uh, which has you know traditionally been, uh, you know, mostly around the the experiences in uh, SQL Server in Azure, and we're you know, as I'm going to be discussing a little bit, we're actually trying to make that an even more consistent story so that you have Azure SQL, not just, you know, here's the portal for SQL managed instance, here's the portal for SQL DB, here's the portal for, you know, each of the different types of offerings. And then finally, we have the developer tools, which are like Visual Studio and VS Code, uh, which have their own very rich set of interfaces uh, and uh, experiences for people who are using those. So when we're talking about, you know, uh, across these different examples, some of the you know really relevant questions that we're getting from our users, and which I'm expecting that we might be getting in the chat over here, is asking us about this SSMS Azure Data Studio you know existence and coexistence, and what's the future of SSMS in a world that has Azure Data Studio. So part of the positioning that I, I want to give here is that Azure Data Studio uh, is a cross-platform play that goes across multiple you know, data services. And SSMS is a Windows play, which is only for SQL Server. And so they each have their own user base and they have their own purpose in the portfolio. So for people who are using SSMS and it remains their best tool for them, uh, there's no sense that they need to hurry up and get off of it. They can certainly try Azure Data Studio and see if that works for their uh, workflow. And there's a lot of new exciting uh, things landing in Azure Data Studio, but there's no, you know, immediate need for them to be moving off. However, newer experiences like notebooks, like the, you know, kind of the uh, more interesting cross-platform, cross-service uh, 
you know, hybrid type experiences, you know, working around deployment for our services, et cetera. Those features are landing in Azure Data Studio as opposed to SSMS. So we have this problem of how do we make sure that some of these new experiences still become available to our SSMS users? Um, so here I have kind of something that kind of writes this up. Um, SSMS and Azure Data Studio are both releasing pretty frequently. Azure Data Studio releases monthly. SSMS is actually releasing quite often now as well. Um, and, you know, I'd say quarterly plus, uh, and uh, which is quite a bit faster than it did a, a couple years ago. Um, but when we're looking at, you know, how do we pull those together, that what that's led us to is the notion of packaging Azure Data Studio as a supporting application to SSMS in the SSMS uh, installer itself. So if you think about the way that SSMS has been built, it's always been this combination of like the Visual Studio Shell, Custom UI, SMO, and standalone executables. And by adding uh, Azure Data Studio in along the, with those other standalone executables, we're really kind of going along with uh, an existing uh, uh, development uh, methodology for SSMS to bring some of those features in there. So for example, when you're in SSMS and you open SQL Agent, it's already opening a separate executable. Uh, and then in Azure Data Studio, if we're adding new functionality there that we want to make available to SSMS users, by having that Azure Data Studio uh, sitting alongside SSMS, we're going to be able to let people use the tool of their choice, but get that new functionality. Ken, do you have any color that you'd like to add to this? Uh, just uh, again, kind of echoing the the lesson that we learned back early, is it all the way back to the early 2000s where Vicky's showing here that SSMS may, it took a dependency on the Visual Studio shell, really came out of us getting out of the business of building an entire UI platform, if you will, or framework uh, uh, all on our own. And that pattern is something that we've continued to push forward now with Azure Data Studio. Uh, as you might know, it's based on VS Code. So it's, although VS Code isn't uh, as extensible uh, as a uh, inter interactive development environment like uh, Visual Studio was, we still build on it, keep it regularly integrated such that we benefit from the VS Code work. And then kind of at this macro level that, that Vicky's showing, we see building these complementary experiences and integrating them together is super important because there's just so many scenarios, so many use cases, sticking them all in one UI is really hard. And so by being able to have these tailored experiences, but doing e seamless integration between them, follows that pattern of how SSMS uses Profiler, uses a uh, da uh, database tuning advisor, or uh, some of these other things. And then with Azure Data Studio, with the amazing amount of change that's coming with the Azure data services in the cloud, though building tailored experiences that are optimized for that is super important in Azure Data Studio, but we also recognize we have a very strong and wonderful customer base in this hybrid world or on-prem world too. So we want to bring some of those experiences together for those folks that still live in SSMS. And as Vicky said, we still ship SSMS. And although we consider it maintenance, it's not stagnate, stagnant maintenance only. We keep SSMS working with the platform as it's evolving. And that's what we really mean by maintenance there is that we keep the existing functionality healthy with the ever changing changing plant platform underneath. We're just not doing innovative UI experiences there, which I think a lot of folks that have built their entire business processes around recognize that they don't want a bunch of disruption in the way SSMS works. They just want it to keep working better and better with the features that it already has. And then Azure Data Studio provides us that more blank canvas to go and do new, uh, different experiences for people to decide, do those work for them? And is that something they want to integrate? So we're very happy with it. We think this is a great way to bring together the products and Hopefully, uh, you guys will give us feedback. Uh, we can get uh, information from folks on uh, what's working well or, or any tweaks or anything we need to make from it. So now I'm going to give you a quick demo of some of the ways that Azure Data Studio and SQL Server Management Studio are currently um, integrated with a thought that this will be something that we'll be investing more and more in in the future. So here I am in SQL Server Management Studio. I've got my SQL, local SQL Server open, and I'm looking at Wide World Importers. So I can right click here and go down to this Azure Data Studio panel and then choose New Notebook. And what that's going to do is open a new notebook in Azure Data Studio for me 
with the same connection information that I was just using in uh, SSMS. So here I've got my uh, new notebook and I can hit plus code and select star from sys.databases and then I've got the uh, server that I just came from right there so I can run it and get up and running with really a minimum of copying and pasting over all of this connection logic. So this is one quick way to go from SSMS to Azure Data Studio. And then let's go the other direction. Now, if I wanted to uh, go from Azure Data Studio back to SSMS, what I would do is I'd go and install this database administration tool for uh, extension which is only for Windows and it uh, allows you to connect from Azure Data Studio back to SSMS. And so if I go over here and right click on my local hostess, I can hit properties. And this properties dialog is actually the SSMS properties dialog being opened within Azure Data Studio. So you can see I've got you know memory processors, all of this familiar stuff that we've got from SSMS, but it's being opened up from within the context of Azure Data Studio. Similarly, I could go down to databases go to wide, wide world importers and hit generate scripts and it will pull up the generate scripts window again from SSMS, but without having to open the entire SSMS experience. And I can go through my standard generate scripts uh, experience from here within Azure Data Studio. So that's an example of the way that we're currently integrating the two products. The thought being that as we move forward, we want to allow you to go from SSMS into individual uh, dialogues in the same way that this uh, ADS one does, where you're opening up just this one dialog from SSMS without the entire window. Hopefully we'll be able to do it the same way where within SSMS you can pull up an individual wizard or dialog from within Azure Data Studio without having to open the entire uh, application. So watch this space. We'll be uh, increasing the interoper interoperability between those tools uh, as we go forward. So as you can see, uh, we've actually been shipping a lot of new features in Azure Data Studio lately. Uh, this is a list of the features that we've had come out with in the last approximately 12 months. Um, and honestly, even by the time you see this, this list may have gone up because we're releasing more and more, uh, inf you know, features and integrations and, and improvements. And this is, you know, leaving aside any of the, the iterative work on some of these features that, you know, change from month to month. And this rate of change has been something that honestly has put us in a bit of a, 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 you know, kind of lean back on our feet. We have so many new features and we haven't necessarily been spending as much time on fundamentals and on uh, the basic, uh, you know, quality and integration and testing and, and testability of it. And so that's something that we're actually going to be looking to make a, a bit of a change to in, uh, in the coming releases. Uh, Ken, do you want to talk to that a little? Yeah, I think this is kind of one of those full transparency moments where that last slide really showed that we've, we really have been turning out a ton of new uh, surface area, you might call it, or features. And one thing that we're just not happy with uh, is the number of bugs that we're getting fixed. Uh, we're seeing uh, customers giving us lots of feedback on issues. We have some preview features that have been in preview way too long uh, internally. We're still not happy with the code coverage. It impacts uh, our customers in a way that we're just not uh, we're not happy with. In the sense that we had to release two hot fixes or three hot fixes, I think, just uh, already this semester. And so those kind of things just aren't acceptable. And we really want to find a way to get the team motivated and energized around finishing kind of the features we start and doing a better job on quality all up and being much more responsible on customer bugs. So what we're doing is saying, let's focus only two thirds of the semester on new features. And those will align mostly around some of the big events as you see here. You've, I'm sure you've all seen, there's always big announcements and big drives around some of these major events. And we're no different. We obviously are lighting up those experiences for those new features with our par internal partners. What we need to do is carve out more time to say, now let's round that feature out. Let's get feedback and actually have time in the system to respond to it. Let's make sure that the test coverage is really covering everything we need it to do. So we're going to be carving out the last two months of each semester to say, let's finish out, finish what we started this semester and make sure it's in good shape. And that's where you see these stabilization periods. And the team's actually very excited about this. They feel like it'll give them a chance as engineers to do more complete work and to 
us uh, and really to stabilize that code that they've built. Uh, and I think they'll, uh, I personally think they'll also greatly enjoy the positive feedback we'll get from seeing customers uh, respond to bugs that are fixed rather than ones that we just uh, leave hanging for way too long. Yeah, and so one of the, you know, the market implications of this for you as users is that it may look like, you know, our interest, quote unquote, has waned for a couple months, but that, that's not the case. It's just that some of the work that's going to be done will be a little bit less visible, uh, and then you'll start seeing a, a ramp up again of, of features uh, arriving in new monthly releases as we, uh, you know, finish those stabilization runs. And I think, yeah, it, it's going to wind up being for the best uh, in terms of quality and also, you know, honestly, it's a great opportunity for us to take a step back and make a make sure that the things that are in preview are doing what we want them to do before we we you know take that next uh, step to kind of finishing out the features or taking them to the next level. Next, I'd like to give a quick demo of one of the new functionalities that we've added to Azure Data Studio this fall, uh, which is SQL database project support. To enable SQL database project support, you can install the SQL database project extension in Azure Data Studio, which is currently in preview. And this will bring in the project support that we have had in Visual Studio uh, for many years. It allows project, build, extract, etc. So let me give you a sense of what that looks like. Let's say I take my uh, AdventureWorks database. I can right click here and I can do create project from database. And I'm going to say database project AdventureWorks, hit enter. Let's give it a location. I'll put it here in my demo location. I'll do a schema uh, organization. And so now it's going to extract those files. Let's just give it a moment to get that done. So now by the magic of video editing, uh, we can see it took about 44 seconds to do that. And I have it listed over here in my database project. So I have my database project AdventureWorks and I can see I've got each of the schemas and I've got all of the tables and I can view their definitions, etc. I can also see that all of those files that were just created were just added to my uh, Git repository so that I can view them. So let's look, take a look at a database project I've already made some modifications to. I'm going to see what I made a change to by going to schema compare, letting the project build, and then comparing the built database project to the live database. I will pick database and wide world importers. Now that I've got the two listed, I'll hit compare. Now that it's finished comparing, I can see that from the project side, I've added a constraint additional constraints down here, and the additional field pronoun compared to the live database. This is a temporal table, so I can also take a look at the archive table and see that the pronoun field was added here as well. If I wanted to, I could now apply the changes to deploy this and publish this change to the live database. Next, I'd like to talk about the Azure portal. So our team is responsible for the Azure portal experiences for SQL DB, SQL Managed Instance, and SQL VMs. Our goal here is to release on a regular basis, keeping up with all of the changes happening in Azure SQL, and to provide a modern, consistent, and accessible experience. By accessibility, we're talking about things being available to people in many different ability levels, whether they're using screen readers, whether they're using high zoom levels, etc. When we talk about modern and consistent experiences, we're talking a little bit more about the user flows and the look and feel of the experiences. That's something that we've been doing a lot of work on lately. For example, whenever we take a look at the Create Data Sync group experience here, you can see that everything is a little bit squeezed in on the left side of the screen. We see the same thing over here on the Create Secondary experience. It's really not making good use of the wide screens that are available in you know, modern hardware, and it makes it where everything has to be really tightly uh, fit into the smaller space. We compare that to the new restore database experience when you're creating a SQL database, you can see that it uses a lot more space and has this up and down scroll bar on the right hand side in order to make better use of the space and to really flow you through step to step more naturally. Another example is how we're working on the Azure SQL deployment experience. Let me give you a demo of that. 
here I am taking a look at my Azure SQL resources, and I have all of the different types of uh, SQL resources in my subscription listed together. This is a change from when it used to be that you would look at uh, the subscriptions from a per uh, offering type. So for example, looking only at my SQL databases, which was a much more limited view. By looking at them across Azure SQL, I'm able to see everything all together. Similarly, whenever I do an add, I'm now able to see SQL databases, SQL managed instances, and SQL virtual machines all together, which creates a much more consistent experience. As I hit show details, I can see the difference amongst them. And then each of these create experiences is going to follow a similar pattern to keep people from being confused along the way. So this is an example of one of the places that we're trying to create a more modern and consistent experience. And we'll keep updating on that as we go. Now I'd like to show you a couple examples of how you can stay in touch with us online and to give us feedback and let us know your ideas for the tooling. Here we're at the uh, GitHub Microsoft Azure Data Studio uh, website, and you can see this has the actual source for Azure Data Studio. And as we scroll down to the README, you can see here's the location that you can get the latest uh, stable release. And you can also download the daily insider uh, build. So this is the build that has all of the features as they're being worked on. So you can take an early look and give us feedback on how things are working. Let us know any bugs you find. Uh, let us know any improvements that we can make. Uh, so you can actually install the insider build next to the regular user installer, and uh, you can use them both together in the same environment. If you wanted to open an issue, you can go over here to issues. And here we can see all of the issues open both internally to the team and externally by other users. What we do is as they arrive, uh, we go through and tag them uh, as bugs, as needing triage, what area they're in, etc. And this is used for us to assign them into future work. You can also take a look and see any of the closed issues. So if you wanted to, you can also sort by reactions. This is how we do our voting up and down. So if I sort by thumbs up, these are the most frequently requested things. So let's say I wanted to go into this one and vote it up. I'll click on that one. And then you just click here to give it a thumbs up and you can add any uh, information that you need us to know about your request. You can also, in Azure Data Studio itself, as a shortcut while you're working, click down here on the feedback icon and you can submit a bug or request a missing feature right here. So if I hit submit a bug, for example, I can do this bug report. I can say it was out of Data Studio testing and issue report. Then I'll hit preview on GitHub. And here we can see by quick preview, it shows what I entered and it has some system info. And I can go and add a little bit of information. One of the things that we like to do is add screenshots or certainly more details. And then when you hit submit new issue, it'll go into our pipeline for us to get assigned. You can follow the same pattern for doing a feature request. For tooling other than Azure Data Studio that is client tooling, you can go to the uh, aka.ms slash SQL feedback, and that will take you here to user voice, where you can enter your ideas here, and you can vote up any existing ideas. And then finally, in the Azure portal, you can go over here to this smiley face and you can give us negative or positive feedback right here. We do read these and uh, we do take action on them. So we're always really happy to get your feedback. And so we're really interested in finding out what it is that we can do for you. All right, so that's our presentation today. Thank you so much for being with us in these unusual times and circumstances, you know, recording going with our questions going at the same time. You know, it's really fun for us to get to work with you and to have kind of this ability to both be talking and to be chatting with you at the same time. So thank you for that. Uh, thanks to all of the, the partners and to the uh, uh, Data Platform Summit for having us. If you, you know, will be here for uh, questions, you know, until the end of the session and please take note, you know, follow on Twitter. Uh, and if you're looking for uh, myself or Ken, we're both available on Twitter as well. And as well as uh, Azure Data Studio itself has uh, an account and we're pretty active there. So if you want to get in touch with us, we're there. So thank you so much. Yep. Thanks, everybody.